For the best audio experience and to avoid embarrassment, we strongly suggest you use headphones whilst listening to Bubble and Squeak. Hi, I'm Peter Sintoscano, and this is Bubble and Squeak, a podcast with uncanny sounds, funny interludes, and stories, most weird, many true. Okay, here's season two, episode seven. Our show today comes in three parts. Part one, sexologist Dr. Jalen Ricks shares some of his journey from shame to sex positive author, therapist, and live performer. Part two, a rediscovered recording from 90 years ago. And part three, a sound slice. Like me, Jalen Ricks is an ex-gay survivor. After spending too much time and effort to de-gay himself, he came to his senses and burst out of the closet. Since then, he has joyfully pursued his passions while helping others. Jalen earned a doctorate of education in sexology, and he has taught at the University of Nevada, Reno, and the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality in San Francisco. Through his private practice in Palm Springs, California, Jalen provides personal consulting, bodywork, sacred intimacy, and surrogate-style partner experiences. Dr. Ricks is a leading expert on the damaging effects of and recovery from conversion therapy experiences. His book, Ex-Gay, No Way, was nominated as Best Nonfiction Book of 2010 by Lambda Literary Foundation. During the COVID pandemic, he took most of his work online and has developed a robust and cheery presence on OnlyFans. Earlier this year, Jalen chatted with me about his work, his one-person show, and sex during the COVID-19 pandemic. Jalen's interview is accompanied by the song A Moment of Bliss by Clarence Reed. I have a doctorate of education in sexology and private practice in sex therapy and sacred intimacy. My purpose in existence is most always to help people and support people in having the best and most pleasurable sex life they possibly can have. You know, there was a, a lot back in the 70s and 80s of gay artists coming out and part of their experience was getting into these, you know, little off-off Broadway shows and really expressing their sexuality and their freedom and their pride. I kind of followed in that footsteps. You know, the whole first half of the show is kind of me dealing with sexuality and growing up in a conservative, conservative, religiously abusive environment. You and I, Peterson, go way, way back with all that stuff. It's mostly about my journey in accepting my sexuality and my self-pleasuring and masturbation and the shame that I carried with that. That's a theme throughout the whole show. I don't masturbate on stage or anything like that. Uh, I do lose my clothes once in a while. (laughs) Well, I I always chuckle when people say, oh, you're so comfortable with your skin or, or, you know, you're so comfortable with your body. It is a struggle for me as well. Yes, you know, I I see see us shedding layers and shedding shame as a journey. So perhaps, yes, I am farther along in that journey. And I have been doing Especially the last two, three years, I've been doing lots of research and working on a new book. Shame is probably the number one challenge we have in our society about sexuality. As Brene Brown says, the shame guru says, the belief that we are never good enough is so all-encompassing in our society. When I look at my belly, I eat better than I ever have, and I exercise better than I ever have, and still the belly grows. You know, I'm in my late 50s. When I see myself in a picture or something like that, and my head's going a mile a minute, oh my God, I look, ah, oh, you know, I'm losing my hair, oh my God. I have to flip that switch and say, oh look, I have another opportunity to give myself compassion. And I do my best to do that. These are opportunities for me to love myself. and. It's not easy and it's challenging, 
it's become a practice like any kind of spiritual practice. If my friend was feeling bad about their body image, as their friend who loves them and really doesn't see their quote unquote flaws, our society calls flaws or weaknesses or whatever, I'm going to do everything to support them, to accept them, to love them, maybe even do something special to nurture them because I know them so well. Let's go to Disneyland together. Or I'll buy their favorite ice cream or anything. Well, if that's what I would do for someone I love so dear. That's what I have to do for myself. And especially in this pandemic, when we don't have as close of connections as we'd like with other people, these are things we have to do for ourselves. And usually we're so racked with shame, we can't even think of something good to do for ourselves. But we really, really have to kind of dig in and figure that out. I find that a lot of people approach their self-pleasuring as kind of second fiddle. If I don't have a partner, well, I guess I, I guess I have to do this, you know, kind of attitude. And of course, to me, that's the the wrong approach. Right off the bat, the number one thing that you could do is set time aside, not just before you go to bed or if you wake up in the night and if you're a penis owner, you have a woody. Or something like that. Set some time aside. You know, I think this is what we've been seeing in the pandemic. People are bored. You know, they're just sitting in their house. It was wonderful to see the conversation finally turn online to go. You know what? I'm gonna have. You know, I'm gonna jag off. I'm gonna masturbate because it is a way to deeply nurture ourselves. I think, in some ways, it's one of the deepest ways to love ourselves, to create orgasm and create good ones. Oh my goodness, that that brings love and compassion to every aspect of your being. I'm hoping that as people have recognized the importance of touch and sexuality and self-pleasuring during this pandemic, then when when the chains come off and we are all immunized or however you want to get to the other side of this we can really blossom more in our bodies with each other since we've been blossoming so much just in our bodies by ourselves hi my name is Jerry Famacali uh, my grandfather, Louis Famacali, was actually part of the WPA, uh, you know, the Roosevelt during the Great Depression, the Works Progress Administration. Yeah, for two years, he, he traveled around the country and uh, worked at parks and, you know, national parks and state parks, whatever. Uh, but the WPA also gave him some recording equipment for him to record experiences. I don't think they ever used the recordings and they just kind of stayed in, you know, my grandma's attic forever. But um, they were kind of weird, the recordings, because I think today we would think of them as very avant-garde, but almost all of them are recordings of uh, Jerry Tucker from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, who was my grandpa's roommate for that whole time. Uh, But they're just recordings of like, Jerry brushing his teeth or like there's this two hour recording of Jerry sleeping and you just kind of hear him snoring and stuff. And then there's one of Jerry writing a letter. I mean, it's just really just you hear him writing on paper. No words. Uh, But uh, I listened recently to all of the recordings, hundreds of hours, and I came to the conclusion that uh, Grandpa Louie and, uh, and Jerry, they were homosexual lovers becomes really obvious when you listen to some of the recordings. You know, I'm not going to go into details here. But um, <clears throat> there's this one that's really interesting, though, because it's the only time you actually hear Jerry's voice. I mean, and some of them you hear him grunting and stuff, but but he's actually singing a song that he says his grandmother taught him, uh, a church song, like a gospel song. Uh, and I never heard it before, and I don't know if any of you have, because you like, I don't know, maybe a historian listening to something. I'm kind of curious about it. But uh, it definitely wasn't from no Catholic church. <laughs> so uh, uh, here is a recording uh, that my grandpa, Louis Fall Macaulay, uh, made of Jerry Tucker singing a gospel song. I hope you enjoy it. I've got Jesus up, up in my pooter. 
She's been lodged there for 25 years. Back then I tried to accept him in my heart, but all my vows were clogged up with bacon grease. So Jesus is lodged up into my poop hole. He had to come in some way. He came through the back door. I can hear him mumbling and grumbling whenever I sit down to take a pee. Would you like to receive him up in your pooter? Or if you prefer, he can crawl into your cooch. He doesn't mind tight and sticky spaces. He's been in church for over 2,000 years. set the scene for you. I'm in Manila, Philippines. It's 2018 and it's Christmas time. Well, you know, in the Philippines, Christmas actually begins like in October when people start preparing and celebrating. But I'm in Manila about 10 days before Christmas and it is a buzz with Christmas decorations and sounds. On a beautiful sunny day, I'm in Rizal Park and there's a big marching band that's warming up. I'm not quite sure if they're actually going to perform in the park or if this is just a rehearsal for some other event. But I didn't really need to hear their whole concert. It was enough to see their, their glee, their joy, their excitement as they were just warming up and practicing. Bubble and Squeak is written and produced by me, Peter Santoscano. I mostly make the show for me, oh, and for you, that person who doesn't know me, yet you listen to every episode. I imagine you want to learn more about Dr. Jalen Ricks and the many services he provides and his one-person show, Stake in the Ground. Visit his website, drricks.com. Ricks is spelled R-I-X. Drricks.com. Also look for Jalen Ricks on Twitter, Facebook, and OnlyFans.com. To find more great music and new podcasts, visit RockCandyRecordings.com. Feel free to say hi to me on Twitter at P2Sun, the letter P, the number 2, S-O-N, at P2Sun. Oh, and thanks for listening. For more shows like this one, visit rockcandyrecordings.com.